I always say the moral hypocrisies are incomplete awarenesses of a narrow mind instead of a broad-minded awareness to see the whole. And when you see the whole, there's something to be thankful for. When you don't, there's something to be judging. And today's topic is about forgiveness. And um, I'm sure most of your life you've heard of the term. You've probably thrown it around and probably told somebody to forgive this person or I want you to forgive me or I forgive you and these kind of languages. But I'd like to uh, elaborate on some things that I observed over the many years that uh, might be eye-opening about the, the illusion to forgiveness. I was speaking at, in Tennessee at a particular church and the minister, uh, before I began to speak, did a sermon on the importance of forgiveness. And I came back and did a two hour presentation that night at the church on the illusion of forgiveness, which made the minister uh, stand up and listen. And the, the minister actually attended the, pro the program I was doing that weekend there and uh, broke through that. And as a result of it, at the particular church headquarters where they do the training for the ministers, they decided to take some of the ideas that I'm about to share with you and incorporate into their, their teaching. So here we go. Let's go down the, and explore some things. I'd like you to write this down, that when you are wanting to forgive somebody, you're making some presumptions and assumptions. One, that they're doing an act, some specific action that you assume you don't do. So there's sort of a self-righteous projection onto them that what they're doing, you don't do. And that you have some sort of superiority of the idea that they did this and they need to, um, you know, you need, to, you need to forgive them. They need to apologize or something for that. And that's based on a kind of an artificial uh, morality, uh, a moral hypocrisy that, that what they did somehow is got drawbacks without benefits, which is not true. And that what they did that they've done, but you haven't done. Because it's easy to point your finger at somebody else and say, well, you did this to me and blame somebody. A Pictetus, a Greek philosopher said, you know, first you blame others, then you blame yourself. And then you realize there's nothing to blame in the first place when you're fully aware. But what happens, you have this event, you think it is terrible. They did this to you uh, in your mind. You now self-righteously assume that what they've done, you haven't done. Now, what I've done, I've been teaching the Breakthrough Experience, my signature program for many years, 32 years plus. And I've yet to find a behavior that we judge in other people that we haven't done. And at first, you may not believe that, but it doesn't matter. I've taken 100,000 people through this process and proven this is the case. And I've got many facilitators that's taken millions of people through this and found this to be true. So... You only judge things in other people that represent a part of you that you're internally judging. If you resent something on the outside, it's reminding you of something you feel ashamed of on the inside. If you admire something on the outside, it's reminding you of something you're proud of. And when you're shamed or proud, you're not being yourself. So the first question you want to ask if somebody does something to you that you want to say, oh, I forgive you for it, um, is go to a moment where and when you perceive yourself displaying or demonstrating the specific trait, action, or inaction that they've displayed that you despise, disliked, and go find out where you've done it <clears throat> and identify where you did it, when you did it, who'd you do it to, and who perceived you doing it. And that's called reflective awareness. Because once you own and see where you've done your behavior, and first you're going to swear you've never done it, but I'm absolutely certain I've been doing this a long time. You have. You only react to things that remind you of something about yourself. And uh, so if you go and look, you'll find that you, you have the trait. I, I remember going to an Oxford Dictionary and went through 4,628 traits, and I found every human behavioral trait in the dictionary that I could find. And I found I had done them all. I lived, I've done every one of them. Nice, mean, kind, cruel, pleasant, unpleasant, peaceful, warful, positive, negative, you know, honest, dishonest. I had, I had done every one of those in my life. So it's not a matter of if you've done it, it's a matter of just going and identifying where you've done it, when you've done it, who you've done it to, and um, who perceives you doing it. 
And if you will stack up the memories of the moments where you have done this until it's quantitatively and qualitatively equal to what they've done, you'll find yourself going, well, who am I to judge them? Why, why do I need to say I forgive you when I'm doing the same thing? It's sort of a moral hypocrisy. It's going around saying, well, you know, I, I, you're, it's almost like a denial of yourself and an exaggeration of projection onto them. So I don't find that productive because I find that, that whatever you say, swear that you, you say, I forgive you for it, you keep attracting because it's your button still. You're still got a button on that behavior because it's still something you're festering inside a judgment on yourself. And so I, I, I'm not interested in going around saying, I forgive you and then having it come back again. And I forgive you and have it come back again and, and draw into your life things that are trying to teach you how to love the parts of you that you haven't been loving. So I don't find that productive. It's sort of superficial. It's like telling your kid after he beat up on your brother, the, the two brothers, now say you're sorry or say you forgive you. And it's just, it's just a cliche. So I don't, I don't, um, the only time I use the word forgiveness is thank you for giving me this experience. That's it. So what I found is by going in and owning a trait, uh, that softens the need for it. And then I go this way. I go one step further. I say, go to the moment where and when I perceive them doing the behavior that I think I needed to forgive and go find out when they did it at that moment. And from that moment till now, how did it serve you? Because sometimes we're blind to the benefits and upsides of behaviors. And we think something is terrible. And then a day, a week, a month, a year, five years later, we look back and go, oh, wow, thank you. That occurred. And I didn't see it at the time. And therefore, I judged that individual only because I didn't see how it served me and didn't see my role and why that happened and uh, the blessings that it offered. So instead of jumping to the conclusion with a narrow mindedness and a highly moral hypocrisy that it's a bad thing because somebody told you it's bad and, um, and automatically because it challenged you and may have humbled you from your pride, why don't you go in there and find out how it serves you so you're no longer reacting to it? When you see that it serves you, there's no button on it and you're liberated. It also helps you look back at yourself and find out maybe when you've done it, how it might have served too, to clear the shame and guilt over it and to clear the resentment over it. When you're done, um, you may not even have a need to say, I'm, I forgive you. Maybe I will say, thank you. I'd much rather say thank you than I forgive you. I'd rather find the hidden order in it and assume that there's a message to it to me than it is to just uh, assume that it's not and I'm an innocent victim and they're a perpetrator. I don't find that model productive. It's a, a blame model doesn't accomplish anything. Now you could even go one step further, go to the moment when they did display this trait. If they had displayed the opposite trait, the way you wish they had done at that moment, what would have been the drawback? And if you crack the fantasy about how they're supposed to have been so you can appreciate what actually they did, you might find out that you're holding on to a fantasy and that's the reason you're judged in the first place. That's nothing to do with their action. That's something to do with your fantasy about how they're supposed to be. Because if we're addicted to praise, we get hurt by criticism. We get addicted to support. We get, challenge, we get challenged, we get hurt by it. And then we are angry about it. And sometimes we're immature and we're holding on to a fantasy of a one-sided world and not bracing the two sides of life, which we need to grow. Maximum growth and development occurs at the border of support and challenge. So if we're addicted, addicted to support, challenge hurts. But if we understand that we need both support and challenge to grow, then the challenge doesn't hurt. There's nothing there except thank you. I find that whenever I'm getting criticized, it's because I'm somehow above equilibrium and I need a little humbleness. And when I'm getting lifted, it's because I'm a low, low, low equilibrium, I'm getting lifted. I'm a firm believer that whatever's going on in your life is trying to get you authentic. If you see life that way, you may find yourself being grateful for the events in your life instead of actually assuming that there's a mistake in the universe. Maybe there's not a mistake. Maybe when you project your values onto people and expect them to live in your values, you think there's mistakes, but they're not here to live in your values. And you're not here to hold on to fantasies. They're here to break those fantasies and those prides and humble it and get you back into authenticity. If you're proud or shamed, those are two facades and personas that are covering up the real you. But the real you is an authentic state of, of grace and love. So if you're in that state, there's nothing there to forgive. It's just something to be thankful for. Now, if you go in a step further and you find out uh, at that moment, where, have this, where has this individual done the opposite in their life? 
look at a moment, go to a moment where and when you perceive the same individual displaying the opposite trait to what you judged. And you'll find out that at times they're the opposite. And then you can't label them that way. And then you realize that there's, when I'm doing things that support their values, they're one way. When I'm doing things that challenge their values, they're another way. And they're just a human being, an individual with both sides like I am. And then I, when I go in there and I, I dig for that, I, I find out that they're just human beings. And I, who am I to judge them? Who am I to, to judge them and, 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 uh, and forgive them? Or who, am, who are they to have to apologize to you? Uh, you know, we can easily cliche things and say, oh, I'm sorry. Okay, I forgive you. But whatever you say you forgive, you typically keep attracting. It's like the husband who comes home late. He's got a value on building his business and sustaining his income. And she has a value on making sure that the food is on the table. And, or, or, or maybe it's the other way around. Maybe the man's doing that at home and the woman's working. Today, you never know. With gender, it could be a complete spectrum. But whatever it is, somebody may have a value on being home and cooking. And another person may be at home at working there at working and making income. Whatever it may be, uh, if the person has a value in business and they come home late because they're, they're trying to solve their business and they come home and this person's upset with them, and says, uh, you know, apologize to me, you're late. And okay, I forgive you. It's just, it's it, what it is, is it's immaturity, in my opinion, because basically saying that, that you're supposed to be living in my values, which is the cooking, and you're not supposed to be living in your values, which is the working. And that's a superiority inferior. And if he says, I'm apologizing, he's subordinating to your values. And if you say, I forgive you, that means you're projecting your values onto him. I don't find that productive. I don't promote that. I think it's antiquated. I, I'd rather respect each other and level the playing field and understand that that individual made the decisions based on their values and they're not here to live in your values and you're not here to live in their values. And you're not here to project your values onto them because that undermines the relationship. Anytime you project your values onto them and expect them to live in your values or they inject the values of you into them and they try to live in your values, it's a matter of resentment coming. And so I don't find that productive. I find that respecting somebody for their own individual values is much wiser. So I'm not a promoter of that. I, I don't go around, you know, forgiving people for things. I'd rather be accountable for my perceptions and realize I'm drawing pe these things into my life for a reason as a lesson. And it's my stuff. I'm, they're not responsible for how I feel. They're responsible for what they did, but not how I feel. And how I feel about it is my perception and my accountability. So if I go and find out what is that they've done, where I've done it and own it 100% and realize I'm not any different than them, Find out how it served me until I'm grateful. Uh, find out if they had done the opposite and break the fantasy of how they should have been. Find out where they've done the opposite, where I don't put a label on them. And then find out at the exact moment they did what they did, who is doing the opposite, because there's always a pair of opposites in life. When you do, you realize there's nothing there except thank you. And I'd much rather go through life and being thankful to somebody than to say, I forgive you and have it keep showing up again. Because anything you say you forgive is stored in your subconscious mind and you're wounded by it, and it's basically assumed that there's some sort of, you know, down without an up, and you're you're storing that, and if it happens again, you're angry again, and you're going, why are you doing it again? And I don't, I don't find that very productive. I, now, when some people say, well, forgiveness means to release it, but anything you judge that you still store morally as a, white, a good or a bad or a right or wrong or whatever, doesn't go away from your mind. I've, I've been doing this, studying human behavior a long time. You don't let that go. You only let it go if it's balanced. Anything that you infatuate with, that you're conscious of the upsides and unconscious of the downsides, to occupy space and time in your mind as long as you have that perception. And it will stay in your mind for days, weeks, months, years, decades. I've seen people upset or pleased with a fantasy for decades. And anything you resent, that you're conscious of the downsides and unconscious of the upsides, that you see all the, the negatives on. That's, you're going to store that in your psyche too. That's going to be stored in your space and time in your mind and, and run you. And therefore, you're going to be frightened about it. You create an instinct away from things that you see downsides more and you have an impulse towards and you're like an automaton reacting, avoiding and seeking and you're basically reacting. And that's why forgiveness is based on a moral construct that, that what they did is morally bad and there's no benefits in it. Uh, and if you're saying apologize, that means you did something you think has got no, no upsides and they've, they've never done it. And I just find that that's not complete awareness. Or why would I want to promote something that's not complete awareness? Just because of moral hypocrisy that people are trapped in about how people are supposed to be. When my observation that human beings have every trait, 
my observation is that if you look really carefully, if I said to you, um, sometimes you're nice, sometimes you're mean, sometimes you're kind, sometimes you're cruel, you'd immediately go, yep. But if I said you're always nice, never mean, always kind, never cruel, you'd go, mm, nope. So why promote a fantasy about how people are supposed to be? I don't think that's productive. I know that that's exactly what uh, Christians and Jews and, and Islamic followers and various religious people like to promote, but I don't find it to be true. So I'm just going to be able to share that right now. With you. So, so I've been doing the breakthrough experience for you know, 32 years plus, and I've had people come into the, the programs with a lot of resentment about certain things in their life. And um, when they come in they're they're, they're even, they're so rage and upset sometimes it's like crazy. And then when they go out, they realize there's nothing there except thank you. And all I did is ask them a series of questions. The quality of your life is based on the quality of the questions you ask. If you ask some amazing questions to equilibrate the mind, you liberate your mind from a lot of emotional baggage. So I don't, I don't find it productive to say I forgive, I forgive you or I'm sorry, because I found out that whenever I do, I just keep repeating it. I keep doing the things I'm sorry about and I keep attracting the things that I forgive. And I find that that's just a, a frustration to, to try to do it. So let's, let's reiterate again, just take a look at it. Whatever you see in other people that you think they did that has more drawbacks and benefits, you can sit there and say, I forgive you and hope they don't do it again and live in fear and anxiousness about them doing it and then be an automaton reacting to whatever goes around you and then facing that situation again and say, I forgive you again if they do it again. Or you can actually go and own the trait 100% and um, humble yourself and then go find out how it served you until you're grateful. And then go find out how if they've been the opposite, uh, what with the drawback to crack the fantasy about how life's supposed to be. Because most of the problems that we face in life are the comparison of our current reality to a fantasy we're addicted to. Uh, we're addicted to the idea that everybody's supposed to be nice, not mean, not kind, not cruel. Let me listen to, I remember my grandmother's just saying, now be nice, don't be mean, be kind, don't be cruel, be positive, don't be negative, be generous, don't be stingy, right? Be peaceful, don't be wrathful. And then five seconds later, she'd go and yell and scream and, and bitch and demand from grandpa. <laughs> and we were like going, wait a minute now, we're told one thing and it's, it's hypocrisy. I have no interest in immoral hypocrisies. I find the people who are most adamant about it are usually the people that live in a, in a complete um, hypocrisy. So I'm not going to promote that. I don't find that productive. I'd rather go and be accountable. That way the world doesn't run you. And you're not waiting to run, make the world fit into the way it should be. You're able to embrace the world as it is. The magnificence of the way it is is far greater than any fantasies you'll impose on the world. And living by how it's supposed to be and should be uh, to me is not as powerful as honoring the way it is. And when you can honor it the way it is, it's a lot more liberating. And uh, so I, I basically tell people, I said, listen, go to the point and find out where and when you've done it. Again, go to a moment where and when you perceive yourself displaying or demonstrating a specific trait action, in action. Where are you? When are you? Who are you doing it to? And who sees it? Then go to a moment when they've displayed it, the, the, the behavior that you dislike, and find out at that moment from, ne from that moment till now, how did it benefit you? How did it help you fulfill your highest values? Because see, you know, you can be victims of history or master of destiny. If you take whatever's happened in your life and you ask yourself, how is it serving you? It's now on the way, not in the way. And then there's nothing there except thank you. Why would I want to go and run around forgiveness and then want to avoid this person and be frightened of them doing it again and then having a false expectation and expect them to supposed to live in my little values, my little my little safety box. And uh, instead of it being resilient and adaptable and take whatever happens to me and turn it into opportunity. And, and then I want to ask this question, what am I doing that's initiating that reaction from them? That's a real good one. I remember this one woman came to me and she says, I can't get my daughter to stop lying to me. And I said, really? I said, well, maybe there's some reason why she's lying to you. Because uh, is she lying to your husband? No, she goes and tells him the truth, but she won't tell me the truth. I said, that's because of your reaction, probably. It, you know, people do things based on what they think will give them the greatest advantage or disadvantage. So if they think to telling you the truth, you can't handle it. And there's going to be some really challenging circumstances. If, you, if they tell you the truth, they're not going to tell you the truth. And you're training them not to be truthful because of your emotional reactions. So going through and going, you know, you're now say you're sorry that you lied to me or whatever. And, 
and get all in caught in that moral game instead of getting awareness of why you're triggering that in your child. It's much, much wiser to, if you have a reasonable response to what they do when, they, when they're uh, doing a behavior, they're more likely to be open about it and tell you this is what they did. But if they think the consequences are going to be dire, they're probably not going to open up. They're going to want to lie to you because the odds of them lying to you is about a 50-50 chance you might not catch it. So they, it's to their advantage to, to try to do it. And you're training them into lying. So going in there and finding out how it serves you, finding out how if, if they did the opposite, what would be the drawback? And the most important one is finding out who's doing the opposite, whatever they're doing. That's a mind blower. If you've never done that, and in the breakthrough experience, I actually have people go in there and say, okay, when somebody verbally criticizes you, who is verbally praising you in reality or virtual reality in your head? And you'll find out that you were puffed up. You don't attract criticism unless you're puffed up in some way and elevated above the norm. For instance, if I walked in a room uh, and I and you said, oh, Dr. Martini, you know, you're this and this and you praise me in some form. And I walked in and I humbled myself below what you imagined me to be. You'd keep lifting me up. But if I walked in and you were praising me and then I walked in and I go, I'm more amazing than you can imagine. You, know, you have no idea how amazing I am. And I puff myself above what you perceive me to be. You'll immediately criticize me because people praise or reprimand people when they perceive them above or below what they perceive them to be normally. And so that's a normal response. Crit criticism is not a bad thing. It's a response to perceptions and people are going to do it. And you've, no matter how hard you try, you're not going to avoid that in life. You might as well be resilient and have certain, uh, you know, discover how it can serve you and use it to your advantage. It may be waking you up. It may be humbling you. It may be taking you down from pride. It may be putting you into authenticity. It may be making you insightful. It may be help you refine skills of some form. It may help you go and study more. If you go in and find out how it serves you, there's nothing there to forgive. You just something to thank. And I always say that anything you can't say thank you for is baggage. Anything you can say thank you for is fuel. So I'd much rather go in through and, and dig deep and find out what that uh, blessing is. So if you go in there and you, you do that, you'll find out that there's thank you. In the breakthrough experience, like I say, we have people from all different walks of life, all different ages that have some sort of a major infatuation with somebody or major resent with somebody. And we show them how to neutralize that. So it's not running their life because fantasies of people you infatuate with, you can minimize yourself to and lose your identity and lose your authenticity or people you resent and you go into pride and put on a persona and live in anxiety about them being around and go around and think they need forgiveness and then think they need to apologize and get trapped in all that emotional drama. I have no interest in that drama. If you want to live in drama and you want to live in, in uh, compassion for people that are suffering and all that other stuff, that's just, that's not mastery of life. That's for the masses. That's for people that don't want to be accountable for their life and don't want to master their, their perceptions. I have no interest in that. Uh, if you want to go that route, that's fine. But if you want to master your life, it's about owning accountable perceptions and realize that uh, it has nothing to do out there with what's happening with your life, with everything to do with how you perceive it. How you perceive what you decide to do it and how you act upon it is where you have control over. You only have control over perception, decisions, and actions. And so if you go and balance out your perceptions, you'll have a loving decision and action, and you'll be grateful. <laughs> And when you do, you don't have a bunch of baggage. Actually, every time you're in a state of gratitude, you store that experience in your superconscious mind, which is more light and more expanding. And uh, every time you judge something and you're, you're in this idea of blame game and shame game or whatever, um, you store that in your subconscious mind and you weigh yourself down. And you, those things will keep running your life until you finally liberate yourself by loving them. So why have the wisdom of the ages without the, with the aging process when you can have it without it? Why not go and dig and ask questions? The quality of your life is basically quite the questions you ask. And if you ask questions that help you balance your perception, there's nothing there to forgive. There's nothing to say you're sorry about. I remember Jim Polsky many years ago wrote a book, Love is Not Having to Say You're Sorry kind of thing. At, the, at first I was going, oh, that's interesting. But now I understand it fully. Uh, when you actually get to a point where the, you see the whole picture, not just the moral, I always say the moral hypocrisies are incomplete awarenesses of a narrow mind instead of a broad-minded awareness to see the whole. And when you see the whole, there's something to be thankful for. When you don't, there's something to be judging. 
Remember, when you're infatuated with somebody, you're conscious of the upsides, unconscious of the downside. That's a judgment. When you're resentful to something, you're conscious of the downside, unconscious of the upsides. But when you're conscious of both sides, you're thankful and you feel love. And there's nothing to forgive and nothing to say you're sorry about. There's just something to be appreciative of. And then you appreciate and value. You help them appreciate and value. You move forward in life. Anything that you can't say thank you for is baggage. You can tell me how you want to live. So that was my special little message today is to understand that maybe there's an alternative to the idea of forgiveness, unless you say, thank you for giving me this experience. That's the only time I use the word forgiveness. I don't uh, go around and forgive people. And I don't find that productive. I think it's childish. And I, I don't go, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I, I, I see sometimes parents do that. Now say to your brother, you're sorry, and say you forgive him. And, then, and, then, and they're both going, uh, we're just having a normal fight, mom. This is not a big deal. This is your stuff. <laughs> and uh, yeah, it's nice. It's nice social cliches. It's nice to, it makes people think that that's somehow resolved. But I find that uh, the people that say, they're, I forgive you, they still harbor the idea that there was something there to forgive in the first place. When people come to the breakthrough experience and I ask them to pick out something that they might resent in their life to, to work on to clear, they go, no, I don't have any resentment. I forgave them for all that stuff. Okay, what did you forgive them for? Well, that they, you know, verbally criticized me when I was a child. Okay, well, obviously, if they did it again right now, what would that be like? Well, I wouldn't want that. I said, well, then you're still resenting it. Hmm, good point. Forgiveness is superficial. It's just a cover-up for what's really still stored inside. So I'm not going to promote that. True love and appreciation doesn't require those terminologies. And I'm certain about that. I've been doing this a long time. And, and if you would like to learn how to do that, come to the break to experience. I'll make you go through the process and see for yourself how true this principle is and get to a point where there's nothing there except thank you, I love you. To me, anything less than thank you, I love you is not complete. No therapy is ever complete until cause equals effect in space time. As long as you separate cause, they did this to me and I'm the effect, and never realize that you're the, the cause of it is your own perception of it. Not what they did, but your perception of it. And you change your perception of it, then what they did doesn't really matter. William James, the father of modern psychology, said the greatest discovery of his generation is humans can, human beings can alter their lives by altering their perceptions and attitudes of mind. And that's so true. So I, I um, no, I'm not going to promote the idea of forgiveness and apologies and all that stuff. And I know that goes against everything you've probably been taught, but it doesn't matter. I'm just going to share it that way and you can do what you want with it. And if you'd like to learn what I mean by that and how profound it is to actually get to a point of thank you, I love you for the events in your life. So you're not carrying baggage around and running your life as a wounded victim of history and want to be a master of destiny. Come and join me at the Breakthrough Experience. Let me actually make you do it and hold you accountable and let you experience it firsthand. I guarantee your life will never be the same because you won't see life through the same eyes anymore. It's over with. The victim thinking, you know, that's all that's taught on television, the victim mentality, the perpetrator, innocent victim mentality. No, that's not complete. I, I'm not going to promote that in psychology. It's antiquated. It's, it's there for the masses that want to blame and keeps the, the psychologists in business, but it's not the truth about life. And it's not the thing that empowers people to do something extraordinary with their life. So I'm not going to promote it. So you can do what you want with that. But I, um, Anyway, I just want to share that just in case that was an eye-opener. And also, if you'd like to balance those emotions for greater achievement, because, because if you're infatuated with somebody and then they let you down, you're going to resent it. And if you're resentful to somebody and you want to, you're going to forgive them, all that is imbalanced emotional states. So I have a special master class on how to balance the emotions for greater achievement, because you're going to be weighed down by all those emotions and they're going to keep haunting you. And you can liberate yourself by transcending them, by seeing both sides. Just by asking questions you don't do. Your intuition's constantly trying to do it, but you shut it down with your impulses and instincts, your animal nature instead of your angelic nature, your real executive function. And if you want to get this masterclass on how to balance your emotions, uh, right now there's a free gift, Awakening Your Astronomical Vision, which is a very powerful uh, audio program that I did in a planetarium in South Africa that I bet you watch more than once. Uh, it's a mind blower. It's about how to expand your vision to do something extraordinary with your life. And the bigger, the broader the vision and the less narrow-minded you are, the less probable you'll be sitting there and I forgive you's and I'm sorry. Because you got too much, why cut caught in trivia when you got something massive to go do? You know, if you're, if you're inspired by a vision, you don't have time for trivia. You got too much going on and 
So if you want to go and play a bigger game and want to have a balanced your emotions and have on greater achievement, take advantage of this uh, master class and get the free gift. Might as well take advantage of it. And uh, contemplate what I said about forgiveness and apologies. You might uh, surprise yourself um, and come to the break to experience. I promise you'll, it'll be a mind blower to all of a sudden finally realize what I just said is got some deep merit and um, it'll change your life. Mm -hmm.